Wow, I love that theme music. What? It's it very seems, fitting. <laughs> yeah, and it's very appropriate today because our theme today is our Oscar special. Our 2024, looking back on 2023, Oscar special. Was that John Williams? Uh, <laughs> or yeah, a knock, knock off a- AI version he, of John Williams? No, he <laughs> just got a nomination nomination because of that track I just played. Uh, Indiana Jones. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, Joe has connections. I've been saying this for a year and a half. I'm like, John, whip up a little something for our podcast. And that's what he came up with. So. <laughs> Um, So, yeah, yesterday, uh, the day before we record this podcast, the Academy announced uh, their Oscar nominations for uh, 20. Now, this gets a little confusing because when you when you go back and you you look or you try to do some research and you go, what were the 2023 Oscar winners? There's some confusion because sometimes it refers to 2023 as being the year that had passed. But then they might call it the 2024 Oscars because that's when they're taking place. It can get really confusing as you go back and look at past winners and stuff. But if you follow sports, the Super Bowl takes place in the year after the season starts. Exactly. (laughs) Same thing. So basically we're going to one more game till Vegas, (laughs) 60 minutes, 60 minutes. Um, So we're going to kind of look at um, most of the Oscar nominations that were announced. We don't have to do all of them. Um, And then we're going to kind of look back at the history of the Oscars uh, upsets and uh, some of your favorite picks and controversial moments and things like that. Uh, you know, I always say I, I watch the Oscars every year, not only because I'm a movie buff, but it's like waiting for a train wreck to happen. You're like, what is going to go wrong this yep. year? And uh, that it, it rarely disappoints. Usually something happens where you're like, holy God. See, Joe, you're that guy when you know there's ice on the highway, you stand up to the side like, wait for the speed to hit. That's We're right. We're going to get a 50-car pilot. I pull out my – I'm the guy recording the semi sliding on the freeway and going, oh, this is going to be good. Um, so, yeah, we'll get into some of those controversial moments in a, in a little bit. Um, but let's talk about the the top story of this year's announcements that Godzilla got nominated for <laughs> an award. Nick. I know you're happy. Imagine those people. I know you're happy about that. Uh, first time ever a Godzilla movie uh, has been nominated for an Academy Award. Look, uh, three things. Yes, I am happy. This also feels like people congratulating the Detroit Lions. Hey, you guys finally won a playoff <laughs> game. I'm like, there's a feeling of a little bit of backhand in this. And I'd also like to welcome our, our guest oh, yeah. who has joined us. Because you're everyone's wondering, like, who the hell? <laughs> Someone just walked in, like, no. Uh, Andrew has brought a yes. wonderful guest on. Yes, my uh, longtime friend, Robert Butler. We grew up on the same street when we were in our uh, single digits. Wow. And then haven't seen each other in over th- probably 30 years, right? Wow. Something like that. He found me on Facebook a couple months ago, and we just been messaging each other, reminding each other of, like, hey, <laughs> Do you remember when uh, we were uh, six, seven, eight years old and uh, watching the, the first season of the X-Men animated series mm-hmm. in your parents' uh, <laughs> living room and jumping off the couch? He was always Wolverine. I was always Gambit. My sister Alexa was always Rogue. That's awesome. He was one of the he, he was the first person I played the original Nintendo with. Wow. Well, so, welcome, Robert. Thanks for joining yes. us. Uh, you call yourself a movie buff? Are you a, a fan of movies? Uh, for sure, yeah. I'm actually a film reviewer as well. I have oh, great. A website yep. uh, called De Facto Film Reviews. So Excellent. I actually get to see a lot of the movies early. Oh, nice. He gets uh, he gets screeners. He gets so screeners. That's awesome. Yeah, I get to yeah. 10 screenings. I go to some of the festivals. I went to New York Film Festival in October, and I've actually seen wow. all 10 of the uh, Best Picture nominees. So wow. Yeah, every, every night he's watching a, a, a different film. So, That's yeah. great. We got some clout here. So, and also uh, the – you had uh, you have a feature film. Uh, what's it called? Blood Simple. <laughs> I wish it was Blood Simple. No, no, no. Uh, Bloody well, Mortal. Bloody Mortal. <laughs> I was close. This was first and goal on the one yard line, man. <laughs> first and goal was, on the one yard line. But anyway, it is on Amazon and is on uh, some of the free yeah. ones. Uh, Vo- Voodoo TV. TV. Yep. Mm-hmm. I watched it on uh, TV. Cool. Uh, and uh, it was shot all here in in Michigan, uh, downtown Detroit. It's a movie about uh, some vampires. Cool. And, Fantastic. Uh, and he's this done is... a couple short films that I haven't watched yet, but I'm going to. So, <laughs> and he's currently in production. Can we talk a little bit about your current film just for a moment? Well, well I want to say thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it. But 
yes, I have a new film that I'm working on right now called uh, Phantom Moon. We're halfway shot with that movie, and we plan on uh, finishing hopefully this year. Awesome. And, nice. and you're trying hard, hard to get who in the movie? Well, we do actually have Danny Trejo sign on the movie. Oh, Danny oh, Trejo. Yes. Machete. Machete's in the but movie. Machete's in the movie, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, trying to get the resources together, and uh, our goal is to shoot it this uh, spring or summer, the rest of it, so. That's fantastic. So not only do you have an awesome radio voice, you also are more knowledgeable. I, I, why do we keep setting the floor on these things? For God's sakes. He may end up replacing one of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> the writing is on the wall. <laughs> no, you guys better not slip up today. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I mentioned no, Godzilla. We- that was fun. Um, but there's a bigger story to come out of this, and, and it's just amazing the way this plays out. Um, the, the Barbie movie is, is a movie that kind of, uh, addresses the, the patriarchy versus, you know, women being in charge, men being in charge, whether you're in the Barbie world or the real world. And it kind of makes this statement that speaks to a lot of women, uh, today. And it was an, an enormous box office success. And I, when I saw it in the theater, I, I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, but I, I have family members, mostly women. As a matter of fact, when I saw the movie, I think I was the only guy in the theater. Um, Mm -hmm. But I know women who wept, who like cried when they saw this movie. And it really spoke to women and they really embraced this movie and made it a box office success. So imagine the irony when the Oscar nominations are announced that Barbie gets a Best Picture nomination. America uh, Ferrara got nominated for Supporting Actress. And then Ryan Gosling gets nominated for Best Supporting Actor. The director, Greta Gerwig, did not get nominated. And the star of the movie, Margot Robbie, who I thought did a fantastic job in the movie, did not get nominated. So now that's causing this backlash and people are being very vocal about it on the Internet. Now, there's some some factors that have led to this uh, happening. And part of the reason is the fact that the Academy nominates 10 best pictures, but only five directors, which means five directors right. are not getting a nomination. Right. And so someone, I heard someone bring this up. Maybe it was on social media. Someone said, all right, if you think Greta Gerwig de- uh, deserved that directing nomination, who do you take off that list? And everyone looks at each other like, well, oh, I don't know. So that's part of the problem. It, it feels like they should go back to the system that they had briefly where if, if a nominee got a certain percentage of the votes, then they were a nominee, and maybe they should do that beyond the movie categories, oh. even though now they're, they're at 10 again. And, and just sort of a backstory on that, used to be five best pictures, then it went up to 10 in response to the Dark Knight uh, fiasco that oh, happened. Oh, yeah, 2008. And then yeah. after a few years of that, they said, well, we don't want to force ourselves to come up with 10. So then they came up with this mathematical system where if it received a certain percentage of the votes, they would become a nominee, but it could be anywhere from 5 to 10. And they did that for a number of years. Now they're back to forcing themselves to have 10 nominations. Should the other categories reflect that? It doesn't seem right that there should be 10 movie best picture nominations but the other categories don't follow suit and it feels almost like the the 10 best picture nominations is almost kind of like pandering to the audience because the reason they did that is the 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 academy is notorious for snubbing popular films the movies that people love rarely get recognition from the academy so they were like, we'll throw you a bone and we'll, we'll do 10 movies. But by adding five movies, that did not increase the likelihood that popular movies were going to get recognized. It was just a way, I think, to draw more viewers in saying, you know, uh, Titanic got nominated or something, you know, just to, you know, draw people in. But uh, they don't traditionally recognize popular movies. So uh, without, you know, if they didn't force themselves to fill up this 10 movie best picture nomination list would barbie have even made the cut would it would it have been one of the top five movies of the year i i don't know i don't i don't think it would have yeah in my opinion what do you uh, think for, for if, if you were to shave this down to, to five i i don't think barbie would have made it yeah i don't know yeah. and it's kind of a shame because you know it's it's definitely the biggest movie of the year and it made so much money but unfortunately there's 
there's a disconnect between movies that make money and are popular and movies that are nominated for Best Picture. And yeah. uh, the Academy and the Oscars always seem to be kind of elitist. Like, if we look at this be Best Picture list, um, there are a couple of titles on here where I'm like, I've never heard of this, and I didn't know it existed until I saw the list. Right, right. I've never heard of The Zone of Interest. I, I don't know what that is. It might be a great movie. I, you saw it, Robert, right? I, yeah. um, I, I've never heard of it prior to seeing the list when it was announced. Um, I've tried to see some of these movies. Some so seem really interesting, even though it's. I hope they put some of these titles on streaming soon to give people right. a chance to get caught up. Yes. But like I, I read a little description about American fiction and it sounds very intriguing. I tend to like uplifting fun movies and it sounds like American fiction is sort of a yeah. fun ride. Yeah. Hold over. Uh, hold up. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And so, so oh, oh, I love it. Oh, great I love movie. Hold over. I need, that's going to be my next one. All right. I watched it last night. We'll talk about that. Oh, in a second. Nice. nice. Um, so, yeah, you know, a lot of these movies are sort of, you know, down and depressing, and it's very rare that they they celebrate an uplifting, fun movie. It happens occasionally, but rarely. Um, but here's here's a list of best picture. American Fiction, uh, which I haven't seen. Anatomy of a Fall, which I have not seen. Barbie I saw in theaters. Uh, the Holdovers I watched on Peacock last night. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon I have not seen yet, only because I need to set aside four hours to sit down and watch this movie. Uh, Maestro, I've heard mixed reviews about. I have not seen it. Uh, Oppenheimer, I saw just fairly recently because I knew that Andrew was going to want to mm. talk about it on our last podcast. Uh, Past Lives, I'm not familiar with. Poor Things, um, I, I watched the trailer for Poor Things because a friend of mine uh, reached out to me and said, hey, you want to go see Poor Things? And I looked at the trailer and I said, no thanks. <laughs> it looks freaking bizarre it is. and then the zone of interest i've never heard of uh so let's go around the table uh nick of these 10 nominees mm -hmm. what have you seen what jumps out at you on this list i've seen four i've seen american fiction I've seen the holdovers i've seen oppenheimer and i've seen barbie i have yet to see the others i do intend to because poor things is on is netflix that's netflix is you know trying to get like we can make Oscar movies, poor, uh, poor, poor things on Netflix. Yeah. Oh, no, poor things is actually searchlight, the, right? searchlight film in the theaters didn't, right now. Yeah, but, but didn't, is Netflix distributing it or not at the moment? Not at the moment. Oh, okay. They probably go on Hulu eventually. I'm oh, okay, yeah. fair uh, enough. Okay. I, I was for some reason I thought I, got, I thought poor things was going to be on Netflix, but no. Uh, for me, and of all those four movies, I thought American Fiction and Holdovers were fantastic. Barbie, I watched it, and I, the problem was I saw it after all the hype. Right. So it doesn't live up to the hype, and that's like a cardinal sin. Don't listen to the hype before you go see yeah, it. That's, I try to see true. movies as quickly as possible yeah. so I don't fall into that trap. Yep, same here. Yeah. Oppenheimer, because I'm just a fan. So uh, I'm, look, me, I'm rooting for American fiction and holdovers in almost every category. I thought Sterling K. Brown was fantastic in, <laughs> in American fiction. I love him. I love Jeffrey Wright. Mm -hmm. And I got a soft I spot do, for yeah. Paul Giamatti. I always will. <laughs> yeah, he's. I yeah, think he's, he's one good. of our finest actors yep. today. Um, Andrew, let me ask you this. Do you think any of these movies have a prayer against Oppenheimer? I feel like Oppenheimer has all the buzz. It has the momentum. Uh, it's winning awards uh, in other uh, award ceremonies. I, I, I have a hard time believing that there's a movie on this list that's going to upset Oppenheimer. I think out of the 13 noms it has, I think it's going to win seven or eight of them. And I think Best Picture is one of them. Yeah. I, I, I think... They have it in the bag. Um, definitely not Killers. Definitely not Barbie. Um, there might be a Dark Horse in Holdovers or American Fiction. You know, my, you know what I'm scared of? Poor things. I feel like that's like that horse on the on the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> it might, it might <laughs> be, comes around the corner. It might, it might be one of those weird yeah. upsets. I don't see that happening. <laughs> that horse um, has three legs. Yeah, it's catching up. <laughs> I'm just I'm just waiting for that. I'm going. You know, it was like, oh, it's going to be Oppenheimer, and the and the best picture goes to dramatic pause. <laughs> Poor things, and it's going to be like throw your card in the air. Like what? Yeah, that's going to screw up everyone's bingo cards. Robert, you've seen all of these. Which one is most likely going to upset Oppenheimer? 
this time i don't think anything but if i were to say if anything were to do it i would probably say barbie mm-hmm. it could be another wow that's really? shocking, yeah man. i don't think that's going to happen but if anything would it be that because you have to look at this coda everything everywhere all at once parasite a lot of populism behind those movies if one movie was to do it i would say barbie it's got a huge online clout you mm-hmm. know x twitter before the followers really brought a lot of momentum to those previous best picture winners but i do think at the moment oppenheimer is the clear front runner i'm like yeah. a robert's dark i love the reasoning behind the dark horse as well it's like, because it's like you would not think it is but populism just to keep an eye on it i'm like yep now i uh, i dug up with this uh, little tidbit because of the barbie scandal uh the academy award for best picture and best director uh, director have been closely linked throughout their history of the 95 films at the time of this writing that have won best picture uh, 68 have also been awarded Best Director. So 68 of the 95 that's, films that won Best wow. Picture also won Best that's, Director. That's roughly two-thirds. That, yeah. I, I wouldn't have yeah. thought it was that high. That's, now, only wow. six films have been awarded Best Picture without getting a Best Director nomination. Wings, oh. which was the very first movie to win uh, Best Picture, the director did not get a nomination. Grand Hotel, which is an epic epic film did not get a director nomination here's a shocking one driving miss daisy best picture winner didn't even get a director nomination um shocking uh argo uh directed by ben affleck argo won best picture ben affleck was not recognized uh green book won best picture was not uh peter farrelly did not uh, get a nomination uh coda uh won best picture was not did not get the uh director nomination uh only two best director winners to win for films that did not receive a best picture nomination which is odd i didn't even know that was a thing uh were during the early years of the awards uh lewis milestone won in 1927-28 for two arabian nights and frank lloyd for the divine lady 2829 so imagine getting a best director uh award the film doesn't even get a best picture nomination. That That's could be that shocking. Could, that could be Maestro then. It's with the, Bradley Cooper. If, yeah. if Maestro pulls off comes, you know, best picture but he never got a best director. Oh yeah. He yeah. got a best best actor not. So he he was able to direct himself to a best actor and best picture but he's not a best director. Yeah. So um so yeah, so it has happened and um again I think because of the the 10 picture thing that kind of set this up for the fall. People are outraged. Um, Let me ask you, Joe. Is it yes. harder to get an, a 100% accurate Oscar bracket compared to a March Madness bracket? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to have an Oscar party where I would have a lot of people come over and fill out uh, ballots and stuff. But it got a little controversial because I don't know where people were going to get their information. But there were a couple of people who were coming to my Oscar party every year and getting like 99% correct. And I'm like. Where are you getting your information wow. from? Because I kind of pick mine based on my gut feeling. But there were people who were like, I would see them on their phones looking something up, and they would fill out their ballot and then get like all but one correct. And I'm like, okay, something, something's up. What was the name of the the company that's responsible for the security of the? Yeah, the the oh, what is yeah, it? It's... The the briefcase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, it's It'll a, pop like into my head. Tax audits and stuff. I know yeah, yeah. You yeah. see your, your buddy like, like calling them. Yeah, Deloitte, somehow they Deloitte got an insight on yeah. that. So, uh, but I got I got to say that that Robert uh, he predicted all ten of the best pictures on Facebook before they were Ooh, announced. Oh, interesting. He, he was batting a thousand. And I, I all even, ten of them. I don't even go on that wow. website, Gold Derby. I just from following like the guilds and and the uh, critic groups and stuff like that. I just had a feeling you could start to know the momentum yeah goes further you know what all of a sudden i'm looking at barbie i'm looking at barbie now. <laughs> if that's the case i'm looking at barbie well yeah it's still oppenheimer i think it's gonna win but you, if one thing would be it i'm telling you barbie would be the because he's horse. got a point now because you were mentioning controversy so you know maestro would have a negative controversy because people are like oh why is bradley cooper playing that character should he be the best one yeah and so that's a negative controversy but you know barbie not getting you know with the greta gerber uh controversy now if the Academy reacts if they're susceptible. Oh, we can't have this. You know what? Right. We'll show them. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to be like, it's... looking at Robert. Like, Robert called it. <laughs> See, that's, that's it's a problem. very possible. It's a problem I have with the the Oscars is they're not. Don't don't freak out here, but they're not always based on merit. 
And oh. I know that may shock you. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hate the fact that when when it comes time to come up with the nominations, if an actor finds himself in a scandal, even though he had a brilliant performance on the screen, he is left off the list of nominations. And that always bugs me that what an actor might do privately will affect the results of Oscar nominations. I'm going to throw out an example, and maybe you guys might not agree with me here, but um, what was the James Franco movie that was based on The Room? What was that called? Um, oh, Disaster Artist. Disaster yeah, Artist. Yeah. When I saw Disaster Artist in the theater, I, I – thoroughly enjoyed it and i thought james franco was brilliant in it then he got caught up in this scandal right around the time that oscar yeah. nominations were coming in and he was completely left off the list of nominees and that scandal in my opinion had everything to do with it now should that affect the nominations and this goes back to a podcast that we did a year or so ago about the artist versus the art. Yeah. Should you let the, an artist's actions off screen impact his body of work? You look at people like Kevin Spacey. Do you think Kevin Spacey will ever get an Oscar nomination, even though he's one of our generation's most brilliant, uh, brilliant actors of now, all time? Now, let me time? ask you that. Let's say all this, all the controversy with Kevin Spacey comes out, but instead it comes out ne at the time an LA Confidential comes out. Right. Or Usual Suspect comes out, you know, well, you know, he did all that stuff, but look at those movies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't deny it. He's or he American was Beauty. brilliant in those movies. Yeah, American yeah. Beauty. So, yeah. Now, the scandal with Kevin Spacey happened after all right. those movies. But so, yeah, you're right. If, if he were to do an L.A. Confidential today... And then a scandal broke right around the time of the nominations, and he was left off. Well, just have that a would break be back an then. outrage. Yeah. That would be an outrage. Yeah. So, yeah, it kind of bugs me that other factors come into play when crafting these nominations. I'm glad you mentioned that, Andrew and Rob. I want to get your uh, opinion on this because I read that uh, right here during 1998, Shakespeare in Love beats Saving Private Ryan for Best Picture, and oh. the rumor <laughs> was that Harvey Weinstein was actively and aggressively campaigning for Shakespeare in Love behind the scenes, mm -hmm. going so far as to do negative comments, like almost doing like a character assassination of the movie and all that kind of stuff. And I went, well, now you can kind of believe it. Like, yeah, that kind of fits the profile, knowing what we know about Harvey Weinstein. But yeah. that's how Shakespeare in Love, because Harrison Ford was giving the nomination. That was meant to be, you know, you want to have a moment, Indiana Jones giving to Steven Spielberg for Saving Private Ryan, which was... Mm -hmm. Weinstein, apparently one of the comments that he said was, that movie's going to look good for the first 15 minutes. That's all it is. So the, hmm. back two hours of nothing. Wow. And I went, That's and then I, Shakespeare in Love won. I've never heard, never heard that. Yeah, that, yeah for sure. It, it, it happened, Andrew, in that, around that time. Saving Private Ryan was the front runner. If you watched the movie, you'd be like, oh, it's going to win. Yeah. yeah. But up until maybe like two weeks before, he started hearing he'd be upset. And yeah. Oh, as, as early as two weeks before? Two, week, two weeks before. Oh, like, like, Entertainment Tonight was saying, Shakespeare and Love could possibly dethrone it, and then yeah, you know, sure. Oh enough, wow, it so that's he the was, Weinstein effect. Yeah. He was yeah. him and his his team were they were feeding BS to the media. Well, or let they, me. Maybe? I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> jump in here. I went again. I have this habit. A uh, lot of Oscar nominated movies I don't see until they announce the nominations. Then I try to make an effort to go see them if they're still playing in theaters. And the year of this uh, Shakespeare and Love controversy, I assumed, you know, oh, uh, Saving Private Ryan is the front runner. There's no way it's going to lose. Then I saw Shakespeare and Love. Have you guys seen Shakespeare and Love? Yes. I, uh, I love it's it. I, I love the movie. It's freaking great. No. It is awesome. I honestly haven't heard anything about it. I mean, I know it exists. In, yeah. uh, uh, with Paltrow, well, Gwyneth is, is Gwyneth it? and, yeah. and yeah. Joseph Fiennes. Even, <laughs> yeah. yeah. even Ben Affleck was great in it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even Supporting know he was role. in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this it. happens <laughs> often, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> These guys have seen more movies than I have, so... Yeah. Now, had Shakespeare in Love come out any other year, I don't think anyone would question its, its win. But because it upset Saving Private Ryan, now people go, ah, oh, Shakespeare in Love, Shakespeare in Love... It's freaking great, and if you haven't seen it, see it. You it's know what? fantastic. I, I will, I will, I will extend an olive branch, even though because I still think Shakespeare in Love should not have won that for. Because I will go to my grave with Saving Private Ryan. That is similar. We were talking about this before the show started. 
1995, Shawshank Redemption and Forrest Gump. You know, Forrest Gump won. People are like, well, Shawshank, and I love both movies. Uh, yeah, I think Pulp Fiction. Yeah, that too. And it beat Pulp Fiction. So what a year! Oh, yeah, oh my god, what a year! <laughs> wow. So one of the greatest years for movies ever. Someone's so. going to lose. Yeah. Someone's got to lose. So yeah. I would yeah. just put it in there, like, hey, you know, I, Shakespeare, love, you know, I. I Sometimes it does a movie uh, better. It does better for the legacy of a movie if it doesn't win. Look at Goodfellas. Yeah. I mean, Goodfellas lost to, to Dances with Wolves, but yeah. You know, Goodfellas has a strong reputation. A lot of people look back at that or like Raging Bull, not yeah. winning, losing to ordinary people. We talk, yeah. to, we talk about Raging Bull more. Even like Pulp well, Fiction is a great example. We too. now have the benefit of hindsight, and you can go back, and I, I printed up a list of all the best picture winners, and you can go back and look at some of those titles that have won Oscars, and you go, wait, I don't remember anything about that movie. Like, there are movies that certain best picture winners defeated that, have stood the test of time that are still talked about to this day. So, but we have the benefit of hindsight, you know, time with the passage of time, which movies continue to stay in the public eye and which ones fade away. Um, Absolutely. And I, I can't explain why these things happen. Like uh, Robert, you probably can correct me here or maybe give me some insight, but I, I I don't know what Coda is. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it. Yes, it was, an, it was Apple's movie. Two years Same ago, here. it was the Best Picture winner. It was a good movie. I, but are people people talking about it? No. What What's your opinion of Coda? I think it's a charming film. It's a well intended movie. You know, it, it does a lot of great inclusive stuff with the deaf community actually casting. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, you know deaf characters in the movie and whatnot. But uh, yeah. you're right though. But that movie was you know, released after the pandemic just afterwards during mm. it and uh played on apple tv which not everybody has apple but uh, there was a big you know following for that movie at the time on twitter that existed and look my favorite movie that year was nominated for picture and director that was licorice pizza by paul thomas anderson the director uh, of boogie nights but yeah. Uh, yeah i still but to your point though i see a lot of more people talking about yeah you know licorice pizza sure more than that particular movie now yeah yeah and yeah, we, we were talking about this 1942. How green was my valley? <laughs> and John Ford what, what movie. movie did it beat? Uh, Citizen, Citizen Kane. Kane. Yeah, <laughs> Citizen Kane. I'm like, what? So, so crazy. So the crazy. number one movie of all time. Yeah. Every time a greatest uh, movie list is published, Citizen Kane is either at the top or near the top, and it lost Best Picture to how green was my valley which is one of the few oscar winning movies i've never seen yet i i should add that to my uh I actually watched it queue. last year for its uh, uh 80th anniversary yeah it's a great movie but yeah. still citizen kane i feel is the stronger film sure yeah that's one thing that's interesting when you go back and watch some of these these uh you know accolades these movie with accolades and uh, oscars and all this stuff sometimes i'll go back and watch a classic and, and go okay yeah i see it and sometimes i watch a classic and go what the hell <laughs> like i don't understand how this got nominated let alone and look a winner. this is the uncultured savage in me that's 2021 nomadland i had no idea because that's right that's the height of the pandemic you know 2022 you're emerging from it you could say okay let's start paying it a little bit of attention I, I'm like, no, man. When you said it, I'm like, well, what is this? What is this strange movie here? <laughs> that, that was with uh, Francis McDormand. Francis McDormand, yeah. She okay. won her uh, third Oscar for that movie. I do yeah. recommend that No Man Land. But I, I, heard, I, I heard it was good. Yeah. I just I don't know much about it. And yeah. like I said, it's another one of those. Uh, is anyone talking about it? What's right. It? It's hard. It's hard movie to recommend during the pandemic. Nobody wanted to watch a movie that uh, dealt with some distressing themes right. at the yeah, time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so. and I think that continues to this day. I, I have friends who are like, I'm, I'm kind of done with the – the downer movies, the disturbing sure. movies. I know you guys kind of like those, but <laughs> I don't want to do that oh, to myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like the, the I don't want to walk out of a movie theater feeling bad. Like I want, <laughs> I go to the movie to, go to the movies to escape the harsh realities that we have to deal with on a so daily basis. So what you're saying is, had Schindler's List come out <laughs> during the pandemic, 2021, <laughs> it may not have gotten its thing. I mean, uh, I made out through most of Schindler's List, so I don't remember <laughs> much of it. But now that's a Seinfeld <laughs> reference. But yeah, I was about now, to say. Now that's another thing. You know, this uh, since we're since you brought up Schindler's List, one thing about one one criteria I look for for a movie that stands the test of time is repeated viewings. Yeah. Yes. Now, there yes. my my favorite movies and I challenge you guys to come up with your 100 favorite movie list. Most of the movies on my list are movies 
if it's raining and it's on TV, I'm watching it. Mm. And I've I've seen some movies like Star Wars: Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, dozens, if not a hundred times. Yeah, yeah. And those are the movies that end up on my favorite movie list. Now, some of the greatest movies ever made, deservedly, uh, are called the greatest movie ever made. But how many times are you going to sit down and watch Schindler's List on a rainy Sunday yeah. afternoon? I'm going to hang myself by the end. It's like, <laughs> no. Those are hard to watch over and over and over again. Do they deserve the title of greatest movie ever made? Yes. Is it my favorite movie ever made? No, because I watched it and never wanted to see it again. Like, it's too depressing. So I have, I have separate lists. I have, I have the greatest movies ever made list and my favorite movies ever made list, and they're there's a little bit of yeah. uh, you know Overlap. the Venn diagram, oh, yeah. but for the most part, take take Saving Private Ryan. I remember the I had I've seen Saving Private Ryan maybe three times or whatever, and the last time I saw it, we had family visiting from Spain. We were sitting at my sister's house, and a cousin of mine was like, "Do you have Saving Private Ryan?" And we're like, "Yeah." We popped it in and watched it. That is not a movie. That you sit there no, with family right. no, no. watching. Like that was I was like looking away, like feeling awkward, like I don't like this feeling. So All right, everybody, we have the Avengers and Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> who wants what? Who That's wants right. who wants to watch a guy's guts get swelled <laughs> out on the popcorn on the shores of right. Normandy? So is it a great movie? Yes. But it's it's a tough watch. It's it's hard to watch that movie multiple times. Now you guys might be different. You might Go, yeah, hey, let's pop in some Saving Private Ryan, but I'm just not wired that way. I, I got to be in the mood to watch that that type of like visceral violence. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. You, you know me. I love my horror movies, but I don't like necessarily excessive gore. I, it just, I can do without it. I like the psychological. I like yeah. the, a little bit of a slow burn. Uh, yeah, Nick, yeah. I got a question for you. Do you think... If you were to guess yes or no, if I've ever seen Schindler's List, what would you think? No. My default answer is no. I <laughs> have never seen Schindler's List. That is my default answer. I've, after I, doing this with you for almost two years, <laughs> my default answer is you have not seen it. I have not seen it, and I'm ashamed about that because I, I love Spielberg, and I know that's one of the biggest movies of the 90s, but... I gotta find his streaming. Look at Joe's just sitting there. You could sleep. ask me. I, I, could, I could take. I would give you even odds if you've seen The Sun. <laughs> I haven't seen I've it in about three it, months. But that's right. Ever. I'm gonna have to create a disclaimer at the beginning of the podcast. The views and opinions of the host of this podcast may not have seen the movies we're talking about. Um, yeah, I. Uh, that's shocking to me. <laughs> No, but um, I do. I do like what you mentioned about on this list. Again, I love that Andrew and and uh, Joe did homework and brought stuff, and I've contributed nothing. <laughs> but uh, when you look, when you talk about blockbuster movies, you know, I look at this list. Rob, you know, I see Titanic. Like, oh, look on just this list alone. If I take just from nineteen ninety eight, include nineteen ninety eight, Titanic, Lord of the Rings, are probably probably the big blockbuster. They can they got the nominations and they back it up the, the box exactly. office. Exactly. Yep. But everything else is, you know, you can say it made it made some money, but they're truly for a dramatic appeal. That's why when the Oscars were saying, Oh, you're how come you're not including the big, you know, Batman. popcorn and look, I don't I don't want to give Michael Bay an Oscar for Transformers <laughs> yeah. just because he gets a billion no, dollars. So I'm not putting it on the right. list. Right. Yeah. Sometimes there's an overlap, like a Venn diagram, you'll get the the box office and the art. Right. Yes. So yes. balance. One movie that comes to mind is Gladiator. Monster, monster hit. One, I think one of the greatest movies ever made. And so it was nice when all of that came together to get the the accolades, the awards, and the box office. I love when all of that comes together. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's that's the one movie. It's on my favorite list. There's the part with the wife, husband, uh, with the wife and son. I'll skip. I'm like, I've seen it. <laughs> Let's get to the, uh, the action part because I, I don't want to relive because that's uh, the first time I ever saw that. I almost bawled. I was like, "Oh God, I feel for this guy." Damn, Maximus is in the whole kissing his like his wife's crucified feet. I'm like, "All right," and I get that. Get all oh, Joaquin Phoenix. You were a good actor. Yeah, I've died. I've never seen Gladiator either. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, no, no, this that feels like a troll. That are feels you like serious? A troll. No, are you I've mocking us? Seen, I'm about ready to no, have, leap over this table. No, this man. is why you have not spoken to him in 30 years. And this all makes perfect sense now. I don't man. see how you could be, uh, you know, 18 years old and. 
18, 16, I, 2000 to not see Gladiator. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. You know, I, I but I, I saw American. I, I snuck in as a fifteen year old and, and saw American Beauty. <laughs> you just AMC. wanted to see. You know what's the sad? You know what's the saddest thing? About, <laughs> you know what's the <laughs> this is why we can't have a drinking game. We'd be dead sober <laughs> if you had to take a shot every time Andrew had seen one of these movies. We'd be dead sober. This thing goes back to nineteen twenty eight. <laughs> you know what? I, I get mad at myself. When I finally get around to seeing a movie that people have told me to watch for years, and when I sit down and love it, I get mad at myself that I've spent a portion of my life not having been exposed to this movie. Like, yeah, I eventually get to it. Sure. But uh, an old classic that I just watched uh, recently was um, uh, Miss Miniver was one of them. And is that the one? That's the wartime one. Miss Miniver was the wartime uk production or something mm, I'm not, but then not but then there's another one with uh i should have wrote these down joan what's joan crawford what was the big one that she had mildred pierce mildred, okay mildred, yes. i had i'm embarrassed to say this i'd never seen mildred pierce until just a few months ago and i think i found it at second and charles used dvd i popped it in i watched it i'm like Joe, you're a disgrace. You you host these movie podcasts, <laughs> and you're only just now seeing this movie. It was, it was that good. It was that good, and and you go, okay, I get the whole Joan Crawford thing now. Is that like, in like probably mid fifties or thirties? Uh, Great Depression. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so yeah, I get mad at myself when I, I I try to make an effort to see these nominated movies, but just that's some of them don't appeal to me. But that's because you don't utilize the Drew Shield like I do. Because I always say. <laughs> As long as I have Drew next to me, I won't have to feel as bad. <laughs> I won't feel that type of guilt. I'm like, God, God Nick, how did you oh. not see? Like, I felt the Thanks. same. No, 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 look. <laughs> there, there has to, we, we have to use it. Otherwise, it's a waste of not you not seeing moves. We have to have some benefit to it. You know, I, no, Joe brought up a good point because I felt that way about the French Connection. For yeah. a while, because yes. I always enjoy these movies. Yes. And like, it's a great movie. Yes. And I, I didn't that, see that. That chase scene. Oh, oh. my God. You yeah. know what? You know when the first time I saw that? In the 21st century. Oh yeah, yeah, and that was like about 2004. I was like, oh, friend, you know, I've been talking about it. Gene Hatton, I S saw it before you. I you saw go. it in high school, probably Ooh, 2002. Look at this that! Is first. This is he a gets first. A credit. Yeah. By 2004, I saw French Connection. Went, what took me so long? You know what changed my life? I don't know if this is literally, but what changed my life? I was I was on Facebook the other day, and you know how you get the memories come up, and I was looking at my memories, and it was the 15th anniversary of me joining Netflix. But oh, yeah. it was when post. you got DVDs in the mail. I used to long them. before the streaming. I think streaming might have been an op separate option. But I I signed up to the DVD subscription thing, and I got to the point where I can have two DVDs at any given moment. And wow, so, high high class. So fifteen <laughs> years ago is when I created a, a wish list of about a hundred movies, and I said I'm going to knock out this list, and I saw all the classics wow. in a relatively short period of time. And that's when I got caught up on a lot of these great, great So uh, you movies. gave them the foundational data for binge watching. Like some <laughs> dude ordered 16 DVDs <laughs> and he returned them all and he must have seen uh, them all in a row. Yeah. That's binge watching. When I had, <laughs> <laughs> when, when I, they allowed me to watch two, what would happen is one would come in the mail, I'd watch it, seal it up, mail it back. The second one would come in, I'd watch it, seal it up, mail it back. And so I was yeah. getting pretty much on average two movies a week, I, and I was turning them around quickly. When, they w did not collect dust. When when I lived in Houston uh, for two and a half years, I I did that, but through block, Blockbuster used to have oh, a, sure. a thing, and yeah. I would I would find things like I I, I did the opposite. I, I would look for the most obscure, <laughs> you know, sci-fi horror, um, maybe a Woody Allen movie that you know you can't find on DVD any or you can't find anywhere else, you know. Um, and that's when I watched a lot of indie films uh, yeah. when I was in Houston. And I had the same thing. Uh, every other day I was I was getting them in yeah. the mail. Yep. And I, I feel like I'm a better person for having finally got caught up. Yeah. I, I went through a Hitchcock phase where I was getting one Hitchcock movie after another. And it's it w I felt like they were empowering me like, Eating a mushroom and Mario, like, <laughs> and I'm like, and then I, getting a star. Oh and go, my God. Imagine 
within the last 15 years seeing uh, North by Northwest oh. for the first time. Like, oh, yeah. I got to see movies like that for the first time, and I'm like, these are freaking great. So I came out of that. I emerged from that a better person having seen And you those talk about too. someone, and Robert, you, probably, you talk about someone who's the Buffalo Bills of, he had the, what, 58, 59, 60, North by Northwest, Vertigo, Psycho. Psycho. Yeah. yeah. Didn't get a That's nominee. Right. Like, Nothing. he just, it, I was like, what? Three years ago, like Hitchcock should win this, right? This year, this year, yeah. this year, like yeah. you got to be kidding me. His nineteen forties and fifties filmography are on that stage is just unfathomable to think yeah. that he yeah. made all those great Wait, movies. Yeah. Did Netflix. he ever win a? I don't an, think he did. Oscar, Oscar. No. for anything like director or. And you talk about personality. Oh wow. so Maybe that his personality, his yeah, yeah. rumors of him in Hollywood might have come back to bite him in the ass. You uh, know who else uh, had that Susan Lucci curse for a long time was Steven Spielberg. I mean, when you think about the treasures that he contributed to cinema, he was not recognized for a yeah. long, long time Schindler's List until first, Schindler's yeah. List. Yeah, yeah. About and, a good. Yeah. 20 years since yeah. he entered Hollywood. And it was minimum shocking. Like, what did Hollywood have against Jaws, Spielberg? E. Isn't that with Scorsese, too? Scorsese. Yeah, well, yeah interesting fact, just uh, with this nomination that Scorsese got. He just surpassed Spielberg at 10 nominations. Spiel- Spielberg had nine best director nominees. Scorsese has 10, and now William Wyler has the record of 12. It's like wow. Joe DiMaggio in baseball. And, yeah. <laughs> and Scorsese <laughs> surpassed him. He's in, you know He's like 80 now. I mean, anything's possible. And, he can and, make three more movies. This, but he's got one to his name. Yeah. He's yeah. got one with, Oscar. With the Departed. To his name. Yeah, for yeah. The Departed in 2006. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His first nominee, his first nominee was crazy? Raging Bull. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. For, you, they're yeah. talking about 25 years. Best director years. nominee was Best director, yeah. 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 Well, you know, talking about great movies that didn't get a director nomination, you mentioned Jaws. Oh. If I were to say that Jaws did not get a Best Director right. nomination, it's, yep. it's incredulous. Like, are you kidding me? Jaws is one of the greatest right. movies of all time, and it did not. He did not get, and he was this young upstart, and they almost pulled the plug on that movie. Right. That movie aged him. Yeah, and <laughs> to think, to think that it he did not get a director nomination for that is one of the great travesties of the history of the Oscars. And taxi driver Scorsese did not get director nomination. Yeah. For that. Gosh. The picture nominee, but not director. God. You know, you talk about so a 10% amazing. win percentage on that thing. That's like John Williams. John Williams has what? 94 nominations and five Oscar wins. Wow. Yeah. I, at some point I'm like, you got to. <laughs> like, no. Imagine being a composer and they're like, Hey, you got nominated for an Oscar. And you're like, who else got nominated? John Williams. Damn it. Like he, you know, you're That's not. That's where going I to. take the nomination as the win. I'm like, I made the final four. I'm good. Everything else is gravy. But then, and then you're sitting there going, and the winner is John Williams. <laughs> Other guy. What? <laughs> I'm almost mad. I won. Could you imagine you beat John Williams? And like, oh sorry. my god, oh, I would be using that line at the bar all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact. <laughs> so, and hey, let's talk about these best picture nominees. Yeah. Um, of the ones that I have seen, all of them are flawed. None of them are perfect. Um, Andrew, I know you love Oppenheimer, and Mm -hmm. when I watched it, I liked it. I didn't love it, but not only did I think an hour could have been trimmed out of that film, but there were some questionable decisions made by Christopher Nolan. We talked about it on our last podcast, but like the the sex scene in during the uh, during the hearing, yeah, the hallucination. Why? Why? Why was that necessary? And and the decision to focus on that that trial basically the hearing and not necessarily on the aftermath of killing tens of thousands of people with this bomb you created. Sure. There were some questionable decisions made. So yeah, it's the front runner and, and it's a great movie, but it's, it's definitely flawed. Um, let's talk about the holdovers. You said you love the whole holdovers. No, I haven't, I haven't, haven't seen it. Who he, saw, you saw it. the holdovers. Yeah, you these, saw the holdovers. I love it. These two loved it. I watched it last night and I, the, the only reason it took so long for me to watch it is because looking at the trailers and stuff, I'm like, we've seen this before. We've seen uh, Dead Poet Society. We've seen, uh, what was the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck oh, movie? Good uh, Goodwill Hunting. We've, we've seen these mentor professors and, and, you know, troublesome students. And we've seen it time and time again. And that's one of the problems that I have with the film is it didn't feel very fresh or original to me. It was, it was something that we had seen many, many times. Hmm. I thought it was a little pretentious. The, 
dialogue. Like there were times where I'm like, I don't know what they're saying here. It was like, <laughs> I almost had to turn on subtitles to figure out what was being said here. Like when Paul Giamatti's character was kind of beating down uh, the, the guys in the bar and he, he says something to him and, they turn to the student like, what did he just say? The, the uh, he, he wants quote. to buy you a drink. <laughs> but he used like this flowery language to get it across. And I, to me, it felt a little pretentious, a little wordy, uh, a little slow. And like I said, it, I've seen that premise before. So I don't think it's necessarily a front runner. What can you say to defend the holdovers? I'm going to uh, defer to Robert on this because all that I'm going to say is Paul Giamatti. <laughs> and it's a sad, sad defense. I'm like, Paul Giamatti. Everything, it's like, it's, I'm going to plead the fifth. I'm going, to, I'm going to plead the Paul Giamatti. That's I'm like going to, Giamatti. going to Rotten Tomatoes and go, what's this movie about? Description, Paul Giamatti. Oh, <laughs> that sounds and good. And that's why I can be an honest film critic. Because, <laughs> and we, I defer to people like Robert who actually have talent in this. Robert, let's do point counterpoint. I just made my point about the holdovers. Can you counterpoint it? Well, Joe, everything that you brought up has been long standing criticisms of Alexander Payne, the director of this film. He didn't write the screenplay, but he right. uh, he got a writer in the film that went to boarding school. But, you know, this dates back to election about Schmidt sideways. His films, in a way, are kind of an acquired taste, but I do think that they're accessible enough to meet general appeal. And his films are very sophisticated. Some could dismiss it as pretentious. Sure. You know, they're, they're uh, a lot of the films are about intellectuals, and they kind of have that snooty side. But what I love about Pain movies is he brings no pun intended here pain to his characters and they're very mm -hmm. flawed characters they're very lonely characters and he mm -hmm. really taps into the human condition quite well especially with uh, Paul Giamatti's yeah. character here he's a very sad lonely guy he kind of masks himself as this grandiose smart professor but deep down he's a very Isolated, lonely man yeah. yeah and he ends up yeah. finding a strong connection with this uh, young boy and in, uh, in the film and they uh, he ends up seeing there's a lot of reflections of himself within him it's almost like a younger version of himself and i'm going to dumb down the point here by saying i got a little bit of rick and morty taste in it <laughs> there's a little bit of rick and morty just a tad bit of, i was like the mentor and this is like the, the the whiny student and he's like what is wrong with you man i, I, I love the character depth in the movie though. Yeah. i like the, the yeah. performances and uh, the it almost felt too real like i felt like i was hanging out on campus with these guys which is is a testament to the movie but not a, a great story. Like hanging out with someone in the middle of winter on a campus is kind of boring. And that's kind of what I got from the movie. But, and also I don't, I don't want to ruin the ending or anything, but I, you know, my, my Hollywood uh, thing that I enjoy in movies is when uh, the good guy gets rewarded or redeemed and the villain, you know, gets punished or whatever. And, and the ending of the movie, I thought, uh, <sighs> Paul Giamatti's character didn't deserve the ending that he got in the movie. And so as the credits are rolling, I was like depressed. Like, really? oh, he didn't deserve oh, wow. that. I was kind of, I was kind of rooting for him because he's going to have a new beginning, a new chapter in his life. Cause I think in the, the day he needed to not reveal anything, but yeah. I think he needed a new start. Yeah. I think that, mm. You know, that encounter with the kid and the troubles they went through. Yeah. Going to launch a new beginning for him. So that's kind of how I maybe, it, maybe it just kind of set off a panic in me. Cause I'm, I'm closing in on 60 and if, if if I was told by my boss, hey, start a new chapter, I'd be like, oh, shit, man. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt at the end of the movie. Like, you know, he's an older guy, and uh, he's starting over at this point. So It takes a little bit of that up-in-the-air <laughs> moment when they're telling J.K. Simmons, you, when George Quinn tells him, you get a chance to, what do you want to do? What dream did, how much did they pay you to give up on your dream? Mm -hmm. It's like, I want to be a cook. And he says, well, go do that now. Cook mm -hmm. for your family, like. So maybe that's why I, I took a little bit of that when with, with Paul Giamatti when like Robert was saying at the end oh, yeah he runs into his old classmate who he, oh yeah he kind of disguised he pretty much spills the beans what he wants to be yeah. teaching at Harvard and stuff like that so I kind of what I got out of it he's gonna go into something better yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I that's, I hope. That, that's what I, I guess what I choose to, to, to interpret yeah that's what I choose to believe yeah <laughs> yeah thank, thank, that's the beauty of art <laughs> let me interpret how I feel Paul Giamatti's character would have gone and done that. Did you like how I chat GPT to everything of Robert? <laughs> <laughs> I, I let him put all the work, and I'm like, I'm just going to chat GPT all this. And put my thing. You, you gave him the parameters, and he filled in the blanks. And that's no. how you do it, kids. Exactly. That's how you do, don't contribute anything. Now, one thing I found mildly distracting in the film is early on in the film, I'm like, I did not know Paul Giamatti had a lazy eye. 
And it turns out that was some sort of an effect or yes. a, a lens or something. But it was a creative decision that the director made. Uh, and I think he collaborated with Giamatti and they decided together that he should have a lazy eye. The weird thing that I found distracting is that it changed eyes. Sometimes it was his left eye. Sometimes it was his right eye. But kind of like the humps on yeah, Young Frank yeah. Oh, I did it? I have to look for that next time. I, I, yeah, I did not notice they that. they said it was yeah. a deliberate call like they wanted Holy to shit, that do is young that. frankenstein <laughs> because there's this moment in the movie where paul giamatti says it's this eye and i'm like well 10 minutes ago it was the other eye god damn it um but it was a it was a deliberate call that they made wow. and so i find gimmicks like that a little distracting now i'm like looking for his lazy eye <laughs> now, and i shouldn't be looking for that i'm gonna look i'm gonna I'm not going to go to the theater to go see it again, but when it comes out, I'm going to freeze frame just to find that out now. Yeah. Jeez. It's that. now showing on Peacock. I yeah. love that performance, though, and I love the actress who plays uh, Mary Lamb, too, the uh, yeah. Boy Joy Rudolph. I think you know what of- she's from? I was I was sitting there watching the movie going, where do I know her from? Did you recognize her? Do you know what she's from? Uh, I saw her in a movie called Cajillionaire three years ago. I know okay. she's been in other things, but that's what I recognize her from. So, uh, when I finally made the connection, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but she is the police detective in Only Murders in the Building. Yes. Oh, and I, and when I made that connection, I'm like, oh, yes. that's where I know I her see from. That, but and, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I didn't think initially her character was given a whole lot to do, but then they reached a point in the film where I'm like, holy shit, she's acting her ass off. Um, so, yeah, she was she was fantastic. And my dark horse uh, to win the best sporty actor. <laughs> now, the young actor, the student in it, apparently that was his first film yes. role. Yeah. And uh, nice. was it, Are was you it kidding Giamatti me? that campaigned for him, I uh, think? Pain, pain ran into He did? He, yeah, he campaigned for him. And, okay. That's his first yeah. ever acting That gig? was his first, first gig? Acting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, what it, isn't that also it? true with uh, Lily Gladstone? No, she's she using stuff before, but uh, this is like her first big studio like, movie. Like, okay, studio yeah. movie. Okay. okay. Yeah. She did like a lot of indies and stuff. Oh, like okay. That, yeah. Yeah. It's like Fogel and Superbad. <laughs> so when it comes acting. to Best Picture, is the general consensus here going to be Oppenheimer? Is Oppenheimer going to get it? It. You know what? I am, yes. It. it, it I agree with Robert. It, it is going to be Oppenheimer, but then I want Robert to be right. <laughs> I want his dark horse pick to happen. And I and I, I'm, I'm of, I'm, I'm of the idea, like, uh, I want Oppenheimer to win. I think it should win. But I, I'm not going to be pissed if, like, if, if if something else wins. It's like, yeah. I, you know, the the voters in, in Hollywood, they, they decide what it is. And, you know, that's that's what it is. Um, yeah. And there there have been, like, dark, you know, coming out of left field wins in the past. And it's like, all right, that's that's just how it how it goes. And I mean, I'm not saying anything, yeah. but I'm just going to ask a question here to all three of you. Does do people know who the voters are, who the members of the Academy are? are mm-hmm. So sure. does it, is yeah, it the, possible the to members of the Academy? I mean, I'm sure there's a list out there somewhere, but that's why, you know, a few years ago they expanded membership to include more diversity and minorities and stuff, because, you know, there was that Oscar so white uh, controversy that happened years ago. And then I found out, cause I, I remember when someone was griping that like all the acting nominations were white and I'm like, well, isn't, isn't there people of color on the Academy that's nominated? And I found out that like 95% or so of the Academy was white. And I was like, <laughs> what the hell? It was shocking. Yep. So they expanded membership and invited more diversity. Uh, and you're seeing the result in the nominations. You know, but- and well, I, I'm going to put a mental note for this. That'd be a topic for a future episode because I, after, maybe after the Oscars, how do they pick the academy members? How do you be, how do you get on that list? Because that's almost like a lob, like a congress member. You'd be lobbied yeah, so hard. People yeah. are like, hey, let's go to that Michelin star restaurant. Hey, by the way, yeah. fancy yeah. meeting you here. Yep. I would imagine it's not unlike joining a union. I think if you if you pony up the dough and apply for membership and you meet certain criteria, then you can become an academy member. So yeah, because yeah, I figured that list would be safely guarded. Because otherwise, who wouldn't spend the money to try to influence? Just I'll let you say. There's 90, 100 members. I need to get 20 to have a shot. Well, that's not allowed, is it? Is is it, are, are people allowed to campaign directly? I mean, there are, you do send, you know, I producers like can did. send out these, you know, screeners, as they call them. I mean, I don't know if they can even do that anymore, but they used to send out screeners and make sure that all the members saw these films that might have had a limited release in theater. So here's a copy you can watch in the comfort of your own home. Um 
So I don't know if that's still allowed to actively campaign like that. Well, they, they still have screeners, but they there there's certain rules where you can't do like a grassroots campaign. Like last year, so Leslie ran into some controversies because they were running out theaters, trying to invite you know last minute industry people to see it. It's all about you know watching the movies and stuff like that. That's what it all comes down to. Yeah, you know, Barbie, of course, everybody saw Barbie. It was well liked by the you know public and by the industry. They a lot of people in the infrastructure yeah. like it as well so that's why i was nominated so it all depends who's watching the movies and if they watched them yeah and, and you know ah. and that's that's always kind of controversial too is uh, you know a movie has to be seen in a theater by the end of the calendar year so a lot of these nominated films get this very limited release in new york and la yes. in like on december 20th or something <laughs> right and that's why a lot of people like us in the midwest are like what the hell is this right. Right. because they showed them just to beat the deadline in these major cities. And that's how and the, the streamers like that dilapidated building. I just turned into a uh, into a theater. That's Amazon's <laughs> theater. That's Netflix's theater. That's Apple's. Theater. Yeah. yeah, and and that's one of the reasons why I, I think it's Netflix bought the Egyptian on Hollywood Boulevard and just recently renovated it because they wanted to have their films qualify yes. for the Academy Award. So they're they're going to show them at the theater they for two, own for two weeks. Right. Yeah, <laughs> to get consideration. You have to for play the in New York and LA for a certain amount of time, and you got to open before December. 25th or whatever it is. Yeah. Certain date. Yeah. So that's why there's kind of this disconnect between Hollywood and the, the, the regular average moviegoers. It's like, what is this? Because well, it was only shown in two cities. Like the Zone of Interest, for instance, that's finally opening here this weekend at the that's Maple That's a UK Theater. movie, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, it played it's, in New York last month. It's it's only playing at the Maple? Only at the Maple. Wow. Uh, I mean, it might, it'll probably expand how to be now all it does there. And if it gets an audience, it'll expand yeah. to wider theaters. It drives me crazy when I hear about a movie I want to see, and then you try to find it, and it's like, oh, you just missed it. It was at the Maple for 24 hours. I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's very frustrating. And I remember, uh, not that this deviates from our Oscar talk, but uh, there's the movie Black Dynamite. You remember Black yeah, Dynamite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People were raving about this movie. Yeah. I couldn't find it anywhere. It wasn't showing anywhere. Yeah, only so, the Burton Theater played that down in Detroit. One of the yeah. independent theater. Yeah. yeah. And wow. so when it came out on DVD, I remember the, the Tuesday it came out on DVD. I ran to Target. I found it. I bought it sight unseen. Took it home. Popped it in and laughed my ass off. Yeah. And it's one of my all-time favorite comedies. <laughs> Why did it not get a wide mainstream release? I will never understand that. So now it's considered a cult favorite. Now, Robert, let me ask you something. When, when do films that do well on the film festival circuit does that help them with their Oscar? Like, if, is it like almost like building a campaign? Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, the films that start off at Sundance or Toronto or Cannes or New York Film Festival, the big ones, that's where the buzz happens. That's yeah, where the publications go, the big critics, the audiences get to participate. And that's where the buzz starts pulling. Yeah. That's, You're talking about like Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and all yes. that kind of stuff. Yep. Okay. That's sort of like your interview audition of, hey, I'm right. putting this out here. Do you guys like this? Yeah. Early, early. Does it have legs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, now, I forget which festival this was, but one of the tidbits I looked up uh, about the holdovers is that it was submitted to some film festival somewhere. Nobody knew what the hell this thing was. I don't even think it was, like, invited. I think it just sort of did a guerrilla campaign and, and was shown at this thing. And... Uh, Got a thirty million dollar buyout at this festival. Wow. That was Telluride or Toronto. Was it played at both those played okay. both of them? Okay. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And oh, so, so, so they're buyers a, in the audience for yeah. these. Oh yeah. yes. Yeah. That's 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 where like so, you know Miramax would buy. Yeah. So it's like stuff, uh, yeah. baseball scouts check, mm -hmm. checking out the minor leagues. Yeah. yeah. It's a market. Yeah. Going on. So if okay. you have an idea for a film and your goal is, Oscars, if you can get it into a festival, you, you're yeah. you basically you say, okay, my calendar. I'm trying to get to the 2026 Oscar, so I know in 2025 I have to start off at this film festival, yes, exactly, yep. yes. and then go to here and here, and you can't go to all of them. So you, do you cherry pick the big ones? So you like Sundance, yeah. Tribeca, exactly. Yeah. If you're like a, a first time filmmaker, you got stronger chances of uh, going to Sundance probably, which is still yeah. very difficult to get into, mind you. But if you're a filmmaker that's a little bit more prolific, like Alexander Payne, the holdovers, he was able to get into Toronto. Focus bought it out at one of those festivals. Was Miramax on the European yeah, rights? Yeah, that Mir then, That's what was kind of yeah. interesting about the holdovers is the opening credits. I'm like, am I watching the right movie? Because you heard like popping and cracking on the soundtrack, and you saw like hairs and dust on the screen, and then like the Miramax logo came up, and I'm yeah. like, 
what am I watching? Is this the right movie? And it just did this deliberate seventies kind of right. a feel of like you're watching an old movie. And I thought, okay, you got me. Yeah, you hooked old, me with that. That's old, pretty old cool. Old Hal Ashby film. Yeah, Harold and Maude. Harold and Maude. Oh, Harold and Maude. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, if it gets buzz at the festivals, then they try to carry that into the Oscars, try to get that theater screening because that's that's a a mandate you know you, yep. it has to be shown in a theater to get oscar consideration and so and if you, you, hope if for the you best. rack up enough buzz on the film festival some theater in la or new york will play it yeah that's your yeah. goal well the distributor will do it yeah oh right release. right okay and they'll try yeah. to get it uh, by december you know yeah um let's talk about some of the other other categories here uh again you know i i look at this list let's the next one that's on here is Best Actress. I, I look at this list. I, I haven't heard of some of these movies. Um, I don't, what, what is it, Nyad? Is that how yeah, you Nyad, pronounce yeah. that? I've never heard of that. Yeah. I don't know I, what but, that is. But the lady who uh, did the swimming from Cuba to Florida. Oh. She tried for 40 years. Annette Benning plays the role. Oh, okay. So, okay. Nyad, uh, Nyad. Any standouts to you? Who do you think is going to come away with that? This is going to be a very close uh, race between Lily Gladstone from Pillars of the Flower Moon being the first Native American to win. She's great in this. Or uh, Emma Stone for four things. It's going to come down to that. So keep an outlook at that hmm. SAG. Whoever wins the SAG will probably walk away with the Oscars. It's going to be a very tough race. It's going to come down to one of those two ladies. If I had to take a pick right now, I'm going to say Gladstone because Stone has won it before. Here we go. That's all. That's, hmm. I, I hate to say This is almost like I'm, I'm – I'm mining Robert for like I'm gonna win Oscar Bingo. I'm, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, so glad he said Gladstone, right, but I'll put a little dot next to Stone could win too. Here's yeah. here's this, I mean, this has nothing to do with merit again, but when I watch the trailer for Poor Things, the Oscars have a tendency to reward actresses who are beautiful, but are in a role that really tones that down. And when I saw Emma Stone in the trailer for Poor Things, I was like, yikes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you're, and you're thinking Charlie's there in Monster. Exactly. Oh, transformation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so just looking at her transformation alone, I'm like, boy, there's got to be people looking at this going, holy cow, she's really going all out in this role. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. I mean, that's has nothing to do with her performance. That's just kind of a, a conspiracy theory I have. <laughs> Uh, best actor, uh, Bradley Cooper, Maestro, Coleman, Domingo, Rustin. I've never heard of that. Paul Giamatti, always great in holdovers. Jeffrey Wright, who I absolutely love in American fiction. And apparently that's going to start streaming in a, a week or so. So I can't okay. wait to sit down and watch that. And, and then Killian Murphy, okay. Oppenheimer. And I'm violating my Paul Giamatti rule. Do you think this would be me? This is Paul Giamatti the way I'm. I love Jeffrey Wright. I'm taking Jeffrey Wright on this. Really? Until Robert tells me to change it. <laughs> I'm going to tell it. you to change it because <laughs> none of these actors have a chance to unseat Killian Murphy. His his performance, whether you love the movie or not, you can't deny that it was an amazing performance. Okay. And so the go way my brain, the, not my the heart. camera <laughs> just like gotcha. showcased every crease and crevice of his face and he showed concern and stress and just not even saying anything, just looking at his face. I don't think I have a doubt in my mind that Killian Murphy's going to win best actor. Robert, would you agree with that? I, I think it's going to be a two man race. I think it's going to come down to Giamatti for holdovers or Murphy, Killian Murphy for, for Oppenheimer. I think we saw the split clearly at the golden globes. Comedy went to Giamatti drama went to Murphy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Again, it's going to come down to the SAG thing. I think Giamatti is going to win. I'm going to tell you why. Giamatti huh. never, this is his first Best Actor nomination. He's been nominated for before for supporting for Cinderella Man. Not oh. nominated for Sideways, not nominated for American Splendor, which are two beloved huh. performances. Now, people are going to be looking at these ballots when they start voting. They're going to be like, Oppenheimer pitcher, Oppenheimer director. Hey, I like that Sideways guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, he's they, great in everything he does. Let's right. reward him. And that's another thing that the Oscars tend to do is late in somebody's career, they have a tendency to uh, to reward someone who's been overlooked. Jack Palance. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah. So that could play a role in this. Like, this guy is due. He's or, due. you know, like how they blackballed Lord of the Rings until Return of the King. All right, just get, we were holding this off for two years. <laughs> everything goes to him. 
Yeah. They're not even in that category. Animation, just give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll concede your point that uh, he just might win it because he's due to win it, and nobody would be outraged if he were to win it because it's a fine, fine performance. But Giamatti. I don't know. I'm, I'm going with Murphy on this one. Uh, supporting actor, Sterling K. Brown, American Fiction. Robert De Niro, again, Killers of the Flower Moon. Robert Downey Jr., Oppenheimer. Man, Ryan Gosling, Barbie, Mark Ruffalo, Poor Things. I, I, um, I love Sterling K. Brown, but I know the, the room's going to tell me to go with, uh, because he did a great job, uh, De, uh, uh, Downey. Yeah. When I, when I saw him for the first time on screen with that bald cap um, and those, those, the black and white scenes, I, I thought, yeah. he's playing against type. He, he's, he's not the good guy in this movie. He, oh yeah, yeah, and and this is like we were talking about the second half of that movie where it gets more political and stuff. He shines. He he is. Oh, when ass. he starts like turning on yes. uh, and, Oppenheimer, and then I texted all of my my movie nerd friends after the I got out of the movie and I said RDJ for sure is going to get nominated for supporting, should win. Yeah, and I, I still stand by that. Yeah, you know what's nice about social media is you can post that stuff and then go back to it. I had something pop up recently where I said, uh, congratulations to Emma Stone for her Oscar win for La La Land. I posted that a couple of months before the Oscars, <laughs> and it panned out. Yeah. And I feel the same way about uh, about RDJ. Is, yes. is, again, he's, he's beloved in Hollywood. He's gone through some stuff. This is the time for Hollywood to embrace him yes. and reward him, and I have no doubt in my mind he's going to win it. And someone correct me on this. I feel like there's like this man sacrificed ten years, in at least ten years. He gave it to the bi- popcorn munchers yeah. at Marvel. Now he's come back to his acting roots. Right. Let's reward him. But did he not act in those Marvel movies though? I think he acted his butt yes, off but in a, those it, movies. But it's a comic book movie. It's, we already know they yeah, don't care. It's not recognized by the Oscars, but he he uh, yeah. made those movies transcend popcorn movies. Yeah, he did. But and I agree with you. But my main thing is he played so well against type. Right. I he put a hundred percent into that role. Yeah. Against type and not an easy thing to do. I so know. I'm with you, Joey. He's the clear front runner. Nobody could. Top him. I have to say, I am disappointed with an actor I thought got snubbed in this. I just want to mention this is uh, Charles Melton for May December, my absolute favorite supporting performance. And he had a oh. lot of early oh. momentum. And it's the movie with Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. It's on Netflix, hmm. nominated for Best Original Screenplay. You see the the younger, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's about the true, kind of based on a true story about uh, the a woman who was 35, played by Julianne Moore at the time. She had an affair with a 13 year old young oh. boy. She went to jail, and they got back hmm. together, and they are still together. And Natalie Portman plays the actress who goes and does like an independent movie about it to research the role of Julianne Moore, and it kind of gets into that whole frenzy and whatnot. But Charles Mountain hmm. plays the, uh, okay. the the husband who was the thirteen, but now a thirty-five year old boy. And they, had, they had kids together, and great performance. Hmm. Uh, but interesting, uh, he didn't get nominated though. Um, let's talk about Ryan Gosling for a second. I'm I'm almost embarrassed to say this. Uh, I'm almost afraid that uh, people will retaliate against this comment. But when I saw Barbie. Uh, a week or so after it had come out. Uh, like I said, I was probably the only guy in the theater. Uh, I walked out thinking Ryan Gosling was awesome in this movie, but yeah. I was afraid to say it because he was, he was good. Again, the whole patriarchy theme of the movie, I was afraid to say that Ryan Gosling was great. Now that this controversy has happened and he's gotten this nomination, I'm like, well, yeah, that's because he was great in it. Sure. I don't think it has anything right. to do with the patriarchy. Yeah, he yeah. Did, no, no. Yeah. You, you yeah. could say that if like Will Ferrell got nominated instead of him, then you'd be like, Wait, what? What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, is he going to win it? No. No. I, no. I, as a matter of fact, I think of the five, he's probably yeah least likely to win it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he would. He he's going to lose to Robert Downey. You know, Robert just mentioned someone about, about you talk about actors got left out. I just realized this. How did Leo not get a nomination for uh, Flower Moon? Yeah. Flower Moon. Yeah. yeah, that was that was that's actually my second favorite performance in that whole category. Yeah. Which he won, but he lost a lot of momentum these last few weeks, and mm. he didn't really campaign himself. He was really there campaining for Lily, for Lily Gladstone. Gladstone. Yeah, yeah. And, and I for think, Scorsese, yeah. I think. And I think, and, and a lot of these performances here, like Coleman Domingo, it's just Rustin's that type of campaigning where Netflix just campaigned for yeah. uh, Domingo for that particular uh, actor and uh, Giamatti. At the time, was like sixth, and then now he is 
one of the front runners right now. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that, that film just picked up a lot of momentum. And Leo has been nominated a lot before. It's probably one of those things like but, he's already won it. But that goes to one. If this been one of those flex categories, you could have added a sixth person on yeah. here. Oh, just he, like he would have been six. Yeah. And he yeah, been, I agree sure. with that. Yeah. Uh, let's look at supporting actress Emily Blunt Oppenheimer did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Brooks for The Color Purple, America Ferrera for uh, for Barbie, uh, Jodie Foster for Nyad, Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. Um, again, who do you think the front runner is here? I mean, Emily Blunt was phenomenal. Oppenheimer has a lot of momentum. Uh, I, I I've seen negative backlash for The Color Purple. Um, so she may be a victim of that. Um, uh, is it tougher for remakes? Like I know, like a Star is Born and the Color Purple, like these movies, you know, like they, you do a remake, and the, it's like we were talking about this uh, for Greta Gerwig with uh, 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 Little Women. Mm -hmm. They the the thing was her version didn't really add anything to the previous version, so that's why yeah. she got snubbed. Yeah. Well, I mean, Star is Born got a lot of recognition, and that has been song. remade like yeah. five times. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Now, you know, the, the original Color Purple wasn't as well received as you may think it was. There was like a lot of cri criticism for the original movie. And from what I understand, this is a musical yeah, take on it. Was that Spielberg? Yes. I think yeah. Spielberg. Yeah, that was yeah. 85. Yeah. yeah. So I think. The, the, the musical aspect is rubbing people the wrong way, so I, I just don't know. I I'm think going with Randolph. So, um, yeah, America Ferreira, again, people are a little surprised by that. Um, I'm a little surprised by that. Uh, Jodie Foster, who's always great. Um, I reserve the right to change my opinion until after Robert speaks. <laughs> I think... Uh, I think this is a, uh, I don't want to say a two-horse race because that doesn't sound right, but a uh, two-actress race. I think it's between Emily Blunt and uh, Divine Joy Randolph. Um, what are your thoughts? Who's going to come away with it? Randolph? I'm, I'm I, 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 I like Randolph, but I'm, like I said, I'm, I have my pen. I'm going to change this. Randolph, I think conviction. Randolph's the safe bet. Here. Fantastic. She, she won the Globe. Yeah. Uh, and she's That's won right, a lot of. Did. Uh, critic associations for supporting. She's going to win the SAG. I think she's going to win this. It's it's, it's a terrific performance too. When yeah. is the SAG, by the way? Screen Actors Guild. No, no, I know. No, oh, when, when, when? Oh, when, when is? I'm not that much of a rube. I'm not that much of a rube, Joe. What is this SAG you speak <laughs> of? So they have the, the, I'm not sure when. There's the producer guilds, there's the director's guilds. So they do their own uh, nominees, which are most of the time re a reflection of what the Oscars are going to pick. It's some of the same people, but the Oscars have far more larger committee. But yeah. when you do with actors, it's just actors voting on actors in this. So, uh, so when did they announce they, those? They winners? announced the nominations. The winners, I think, are a week or two usually before. I want to say. Before so they probably announced. Mid all right. to late February then? All right, yeah. cool. Okay. So, all right. So I think we're all in agreement there. Um, let's move on to director. Uh, Ooh, my favorite. Hopefully I can, I don't know if I can yes. pronounce some of these names. Justine Triet, am I pronouncing Trier. that right? Yep. Was it? Trier. Trier. Yeah. Uh, Anatomy of a Fall, Yorgos Lanthimos from yes. Poor Things. Um, I understand he has a track record. I have a friend that's a huge fan of his yeah, work. Yeah, he's he's got some lobster. Yeah, uh, he's got some crazy deer, movies. Dog too. <laughs> we have this young upstart. I don't know where he came out of. Uh, Christopher Nolan <laughs> uh, for Oppenheimer. Another young upstart. Another Martin newcomer. Scorsese for <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon. Jonathan Glazer for the Zone of Interest. Imagine going up against some of these heavyweights. Man, that's that's tough. Um, I think Nolan is probably going to secure it. Mm -hmm. uh, you said Scorsese already got his for The Departed, right? Yeah. So has N Nolan, not only has Nolan not won, correct, but he he's part of the reason because of that whole expanded Best Picture thing that people were outraged that um, The Dark Knight got a lot of accolades and he did not get nominated for best director oh, and so that right. caused some controversy that's there right. too so i forgot about that so i think he i think he's got it yeah, yeah. nolan yeah. oh absolutely he's the, the front runner here it's his year and he's this is only his second best director nomination he was nominated for uh, dunkirk but he was never oh, he, was, right. he, was, he was nominated for some screenplay nominations before for memento yeah uh, in 2002 that's uh, so Oscars. shocking because uh What's the what's the big movie he did with DiCaprio? With Inception. The, Inception. Yeah. Uh, for 
a human being to take that concept and depict it on film. <laughs> yes. The way he did, yeah. Yep. It's crazy that he wouldn't get recognition for that. Yep. That's that's an artist painting with on a canvas. Yep. So it is pretty shocking. So this this might be an opportunity for again Hollywood to apologize and and bow down and go please forgive us and, and give him this award. Not that it's not deserved, but it's time. I think it's time yes. for Nolan to get it. Um, I don't necessarily need to go into all these other, is there any other categories that jump out at you that you guys want to touch on? I, Cinematography? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We could go with, I think Oppenheimer. For yes, that. yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. The fact that they use very little, uh, CGI in that, a lot of it was practical that, effects. And That's the way huge. You, if you read in how they created that explosion and they, they try to make it as powerful and big as possible without yeah. actually making an <laughs> actual nuclear yeah. weapon. <laughs> Can we get an actual nuke? No, Christopher, we can't do that. <laughs> you, you know he asked the the DOD if he could do yeah. it, but no. I wish I had the <laughs> audio drop of Doc Brown going, maybe plutonium's available in every corner <laughs> store, but it's a little hard to get in 1955. Chris? No. <laughs> uh, no, for me, it's international feature film because you know exactly what I'm going to cry about. Godzilla minus one. How, look, hey. I... That wait, you're talking about in the effects wait. category or the cinematography? You well, wish it was no. nominated for cinematography. M- my, me personally, these it should have been nominated for best international picture, and it oh, said okay. Perfect well, Days, which is a slice of life movie from Japan. Which it's a great performance, and but compared to minus one, I also thought it should have been nominated for cinematography, costume mm. design, production design, and sound. All right, uh, I wanna, oh, okay. I wanna uh, say something about cinematography. This is sort of a pet peeve of mine. What was uh? What was the movie with the tiger on the raft? Was that Life of Pi? Life or? of yeah. Pi was the only directed film. That yeah. movie, if I remember correctly, was nominated for cinematography. Yes. That movie is like 90% CGI. Right. And that is a huge pet peeve of mine. Agreed. That if you're allowed to create landscapes using software on a computer, that should not compete against a camera shooting on film or shooting digitally through an eyepiece with shoot, somebody shoot, looking behind it going, shooting okay. Shooting on 35 millimeter yeah. like Nolan does. And it's like, okay, now the, the sun is setting and roll, capture this sunset. Where on a computer, you can go place the sun here. That's a huge pet peeve of mine. Yep. I do not think that digitally created landscapes should be uh, considered in the same category as some of these other films. Not that I'm saying any of these are, but that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. And I think there should be a separate category you know, like when when Disney does these live action remakes, the 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 expression live action makes me laugh because yeah. they are one hundred percent, or for the most part, ninety percent digitally yeah, created. Right. That's yeah. that's not a live action film. Yeah. So I wanted to get that off my chest with cinematography. <laughs> that I think the films that deserve to be recognized are films that are shot through the lens of a camera because that is so much more challenging than creating something on a, a PC. Or Mac, um, I, I think it's also giant monster bias with Godzilla minus one. <laughs> I was going to get with that was uh, uh, the reason why Godzilla didn't get the internationals because I don't like the rules, but the country can only submit one film. Hmm. Yeah, Japan went with uh, Perfect Days, oh. wow. which okay. and again that's all, okay. my, part of my ire is reserved for right. the Japanese people. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? It, I, I always this is your the, national yeah, mascot. I always thought the international should fall the best picture, it should, whatever's released here and. Theater should reflect that and get open up to any country. So right. three great Japanese movies, which there were a lot of great Japanese movies last night. Yeah. The Boy and the Heron was released. Uh, you know, Perfect Days uh, is, is, is another uh, another great movie. Uh, it felt like four short stories all rolled into one. Right. Or, or Monster is another great Japanese yep. movie. You know? Yeah. We, I guess you could say that Godzilla is kicking the door open for kaiju movies in the future. <laughs> it will. And it shows that these movies can be taken seriously. I would be genuinely interested in your opinion when you do get a chance to watch it. If yeah. you can watch it when it comes out in, at home. In black and, for, well, it's coming out in black and white. Yes, it's it getting a black yeah. and white re-release, and I'm yeah. very intrigued because I grew up with the original black black and white Godzilla. So I might check it out this weekend in theaters when they see release it in, it in black and white. I, I might so. see it in black and white as well but because I saw it when it first came out, and it – it did a phenomenal job. I was, I know people like, well, you know, good for a Godzilla movie. I'm like, no, no, no. Good movie. <laughs> it's the best Godzilla movie I've ever seen. Wow, well, yeah. Uh, anything else you guys want to touch on? The, the international, I want to say, I think that it's, it, if you look at the nominees, the, 
Zone Adventures was nominated for Best Film. It's got to win international. Yeah. It's kind of like one of those things with Roma in 2018. Yes. When it was not nominated for Best Picture, but Ron won director, and it clearly won international. Right. Parasite, too. Yeah, yeah. That, that always, um, well, yeah, Parasite won Best Picture. Yeah. Right? Best Picture and Best but, International Year. Okay, yeah. that, which is rare, because usually what the Oscars do is they take a foreign language film and give it the consolation prize of best foreign film. Right. Uh, when in reality it could very well be best picture. And a yeah. perfect example for me is life is beautiful. Yeah. Life is beautiful. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. It did not win best picture. I think it was nominated, no, but with, I don't uh, think Shakespeare and love it lost. Uh, okay. So it lost that love. year. Yeah. God, what a year for movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the consolation prize was best foreign film and, and, uh, and so it, it got its Oscar and, uh, but yeah, that's kind of what the Oscars do. Like, well, we'll give you the foreign film Oscar, but we're going to give the best picture to one of our own, I guess, if you could say that, but that seems to be a trend, but I guess Parasite sort of bucked that trend because, uh, it won best picture. So yeah, still haven't seen it. I- <laughs> Great movie. You gotta, you gotta watch it, Andrew. It was not what I expected. I, 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 it I takes do some interesting see. twists and turns. Yeah. You know, the weirdest thing, I see Johnny here for original score for Indiana Jones, Dial of Destiny, but I think it's going to be Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah. Oppenheimer's going to win. Yeah. Uh, was that uh, Lud- Ludwig Gorenson who did the the score? Or was it uh, for oh, Oppenheimer? Shoot. It's it's not here you are a walking conundrum. So, you know all these details, but do. you've never watched <laughs> like <laughs> some of the most Amazing movies. Oh, I, I, I can't. Yeah, it's, that's what that's part of your appeal, Andrew. Oh, thank you. I, the I, one I have that, a little bit of it. The one that haunts me is L.A. Confidential. I yeah, can't I believe know. you I, haven't seen yes. L.A. Confidential. Music, music by Ludwig Gord, Gordonson, who also did. Uh, uh, didn't he do the theme song for Mandalorian? Oh, did he? Uh, Swedish guy. He's done tons of stuff. Hmm. Uh, that's a great score, you know. Yes. Oh. Uh, hmm. Anyway, he's done. He's done a lot of good stuff. Y- young guy. He's only. He's my age. He was born in eighty four. So, wow. yeah, young, young, yeah, <laughs> young. Yeah. You, know you gotta he, be and questioning you know? all your life decisions, <laughs> knowing this guy your age is accomplishing so much. I know. I know. Um, we only got a few list. minutes left. We got about ten minutes left. Um, you know, I always say uh, with a lot of these Oscar nominations, there's a disconnect, and a lot of these movies I haven't seen or just not interested in, or when I do get around to see them, I, I'm disappointed or flat out hate. No, <laughs> no country for old men. Um, but I have to admit, I I was shocked when uh, let's see, in 2018, uh, one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of that year, was The Shape of Water. I did not think it had a snowball's chance in hell to win Best Picture that year, which it did. And people were outraged. People were like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. I freaking love that movie. Um, do you guys have any other titles you want to share where either a movie that you loved and embraced won or maybe something that you like were shocked at? One quick thing. Adapted screenplay Barbie. What are they adapting it from? The Mattel line. It's it, it fits the rule because it's based on the characters oh, before. I thought it adapted has to be off like an in, like a book, right? Like, uh, now, now it's an things, existing yeah. property. My God, God in heaven! Forced them to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm giving that to Oppenheimer then, and I'm going to give holdovers <laughs> for original screenplay. But as far as yeah, yes, yeah. snubs are concerned, uh, yes, I think back to 2001, Michael Gambon winning for Iris, but it should have gone to Sir Ian McKellen for Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> I've said my piece. Um, and it, uh, an indie film. Uh, that I loved, uh, that one, and I was surprised, and I but I loved it. I don't, I don't know if, if you, I know you've seen it but probably, but uh, Birdman with Michael Keaton. I, I love that movie. Twenty fifteen, I loved it. Have you seen it? My God, do we have to take a shot? He he's seen one of them. <laughs> Twenty fifteen, yes, 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 Andrew, I have seen Birdman. So that going back, that was the last winner that I actually saw. Wow. Was Birdman. <laughs> That was a surprising winner. I think I, it was well deserved. I love that. The interesting thing about Birdman is if you liked Birdman, you got to go all the way back to Alfred Hitchcock. He did a movie called Rope. And yeah, it's a lot like that. You're right. Exactly. So like. his his premise for Rope, now keep in mind they shot on film at the time. So Hitchcock would block and, and choreograph these scenes and, and script them 
so that each scene lasted the exact length of the film that was on the camera so that oh, wow. the scene would end and the film shot. would go, you know, it, it, so each reel was one complete scene. So as they got to the end of the scene and they knew they were running out of film, the camera would back into like somebody's back or go into a dark corner and then there'd be a real change and they would start the next scene. So each reel was one long, continuous, unedited sequence ex with a minor exception toward the end. And Birdman did the exact same thing where they used digital trickery yeah. to kind of hide the seams. But if you go back and watch Birdman, the movie looks as if it was shot in one long, continuous, and unbroken I, take. That That's what made me fall in love. Of course, right. Michael Keaton. Um, just real quick, didn't you... Sh for the film class, didn't you didn't you show a, a clip of that? I might have, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I remember like this, like the sets would move. Yeah. And, so as the yeah. camera passed through a doorway, it was too big to pass through the doorway. So they devised these sets on casters that yes. would pull apart so the camera can move yeah, forward. You did show that clip it, in the it's class. It's brilliant, yeah. and it's yes. amazing that when you talk about Hitchcock, that movie doesn't come up in those conversations. Yeah. But it's it's absolutely brilliant and. And Birdman took a page from that. You, you know, know picking backing off of that, I'd love Rob. What do you think about 1917? That continuous shot as a director, you sit there and go, "Oh, that's another one." Yeah, oh yeah. God. I mean, do you do you sit there with the? Do you go, "Okay, this is the day, we guys, we got to get this." <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, yeah, 1917 is another one of those films. I do think it's getting to the point now where it's starting to become a exhausting gimmick, where we've seen it so many times, but it's still impressive. 1917 still awed me. I'm like, how do they do that? And it's still well directed. But the one movie that I love that did it kind of briefly before. That would be uh, Children of Men, Alfonso Cuaron. Yes, okay. yes. yeah. A lot of films that he did the long take with too. And I, what's wow. your What's your personal feeling on on as a director when you sit there? Would you ever do the long oh, shot? I, I love it. I love long takes. Paul Thomas Anderson, he's a big director, big favorite director of mine. He does those a lot as well. But uh, if it's motivated, it's not too showy. If it yeah. moves the story, I'm all right for it. with a purpose, not just for the gimmick purposes. Right, it shouldn't right. be showy or. Yeah. Well, when the uh, so. when the Steadicam was relatively new, they did that long continuous sequence in Goodfellas, oh, yeah. where he's trying to impress his date. Walking and through great the restaurant. Oh, yeah. I show that in yep. in yep. classes all yeah. the time. Like, check how, this out. How long do you think it takes to block that out? Oh. Well, like the prep on that, like, guys, we have to get this. Don't mess this up oh, on like ninety nine out of the hundred weeks. <laughs> and we have to restart over again. Planning and everyone has to hit their marks and. Uh, it's it's so impressive, and I I I never did look up to see how many takes it took to get that right. But man, that's so impressive. Or do you just have to pray you have a good editor so that you, hey, can you take the the first ninety nine percent of take two and the last and uh, make it look yeah, like one scene? Possible, that would be tough. It's tough because it's moving when you're doing the when those images move. It's really difficult to yeah yeah spend every little frame of that. Yeah, jeez, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, it looks like we're winding down. So, uh, we're going to revisit this topic when, uh, the winners are announced and we get to talk about all the controversies and things that happened during the, the telecast. I'm sure. February 20th of the Oscars? Uh, March 20th. March 20th. March. March, 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 March 10th. Yeah. Yep. March 10th. Yep. All right. I, so I just looked up, revisit. uh, uh, the SAG awards, uh, February 24th. There we go. So like you said, this, uh, Robert said, it's usually a decent predictor of how the, Academy Awards are going to go. So watch the All Saturday right. Awards. There you go. Fill out your ballot. Yes. All right, Robert, thanks for joining us. You can join yes. us anytime. You, I think Thank you, you added a, a lot you. to our and podcast. Your, your upcoming projects? Uh, yes, uh, Phantom Moon. And then you, if you want to watch Bloody Mortal, that's on Amazon Prime in two weeks. Yep. Fantastic. Awesome. Yep. I, right, I, I watched it and I can vouch for it. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a well-made local movie. So, yep. All right. Well, thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And we're going to end with our little closing theme song come to the movies watch charlie chaplin and put some sunshine into your day forget the hard times come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away